most of you who are with us today will have worked on Leo. Um, you will, of course, know that Lyons was the parent company. Apart from their famous tea shops and corner house restaurants, um, many of you perhaps will not know some of the amazing historical features of the company that enabled them to predominate the catering scene, scene for most of the 20th century. Neville Lyons is a trustee member of the society. Uh, his grandfather, Joseph Lyons, um, co-founder of the company, were cousins. The family relationship inspired Neville to research the history of the company, leading to the talks which he's now been giving for the last 14 years. Right, over to you, Neville. Uh, very nice to be with you all today, and uh, particularly those who are joining us from overseas. Uh, a great advantage of having Zoom for our talks. Um, and uh, as Peter has said, uh, the family relationship was the fact that my grandfather and the co-founder of the company were, uh, were cousins, co-founder would be in Joe Lyons, and which makes me uh, a first cousin twice removed. Uh, removed being the operative word because my branch of the family were actually were not involved with the business, but it was the family relationship that gave me the impetus to research the various facets of the history of this amazing organisation. So before I go on, I'm just going to click on share screen to get my presentation up. And uh, it's coming. I want to get the slideshow. Right, so you should all be seeing my first slide. Um, and um, many of you uh, today have worked on Leo, as Peter said, uh, sometime during your lives, but I suspect that most of you will be surprised at some of the things I'm going to relate about this parent company, J. Lyons & Co. Well, you may well recall the famous nippy waitresses in one or other of the Lyons corner houses, but I'm just showing you to whet your appetite and more about these ladies later. But I'm going to start with a little about Joseph Lyons himself, known affectionately throughout his life as Joe. And I think when you hear about his early years, you'll find it quite extraordinary that here was a man destined to play a leading role in the formative years of a catering company. Uh, that photo was taken in later years, looking quite prosperous. In fact, the original of that is in the National Portrait Gallery. But uh, Joe was born of quite humble origin in 1847 in Southwark. Uh, he began his career as an optician's apprentice and he was highly inventive. He made a device that he called a chromatic stereoscope, which consisted of a telescope, binoculars, microscope, magnifying glass, all in one, and which he used to hawk around exhibitions and fairgrounds, selling for just one shilling and sixpence. But he also had a natural talent for painting, and he preferred to direct his efforts to painting watercolours and exhibiting them. And here is one of his watercolours. Um, it's a, a mosque in Egypt, uh, I believe. And in fact, um, I've got the original of that one. If you just look behind me to my left, uh, you'll see the original, which I was very lucky to acquire. It used to belong to Peter Bird, who uh, many of you will have known. Uh, Peter Bird, who worked from Leo and uh, also wrote his books on the history of the company and Leo. And after his death, um, his um, son very quiet, very kindly sold it to me. So um, I'm happy owner of that picture. Um, and his pictures achieved some considerable distinction when he exhibited at the Royal Institute of Painters in Watercolours, the RI. He was reluctant to depart from his favourite paintings, but he did sell some 
of his work to the great and the good, including uh, an admiral in the Royal Navy and uh, the former surgeon to Queen Victoria. He used, as a young man, he used to write music hall sketches, melodramas and songs, and he sold them to theatre goers in the vestibule of the Pavilion Theatre Whitechapel. There he met his future wife, her father was the theatre manager, and her mother was an actress. So Joe was indeed multi-talented, generous, he had a jovial, charismatic personality. And you'll see later that his connection with the theatre and his creative talents were to prove enormously useful to the showmanship that characterised the business of Jane Lyons and Company. So let's see how it all started. Started with, uh, strangely enough, the tobacco industry. In the late 19th century, two European Jewish families from Holland and Germany, Salmon and Gluckstein by name, had emigrate, emigrated to the Whitechapel area of London where the families were first met. And they were to intermarry and combine their business interests into cigar manufacturing company. And they were then to expand into tobacco retailing. And by the 1880s, they'd become the largest tobacco retailers in the world. Uh, well, on this next slide, you're going to see one of their many smart looking outlets with the three company directors, Barnett Salmon, and his two brothers-in-law, Isidore and Montague Gluckstein. Monty, Montague always known to his friends as Monty. Well, the period is marked by huge public interest in the great Victorian exhibitions up and down the country. And Monty Gluckstein used to market the company's tobacco products as these exhibitions, and he was really quite appalled at the catering arrangements. Refreshments were highly priced, poor quality, and so he seized on the idea of expanding into the field of exhibition catering to bring about those badly needed improvements. But some of the older family members, including Barnett Salmon, were highly reluctant to get their good business reputation associated with the catering scene, which was looked upon as a very down market, as you will see on that slide. Well, he was no one to take no for an answer, and Monty worked tirelessly to solve this dilemma, and after a great deal of soul searching, the rest of the family finally agreed to go along and fund this undertaking, catering, on the strict understanding that their family names were not to be used and some other person should front the business. Well, as you will doubtless have gathered, this is where Joe Lyons comes on the scene. Joe and Monty were family friends. There's been some speculation that they were related by marriage, but I don't think anyone's been able to find positive proof of this. Be that as it may, Monty knew that Joe had cultivated important collections in the exhibition field, plus that outgoing personality that I've already been describing. In short, Joe had the right qualities to come on board as a co-founder of a fledgling catering company and, importantly, give his name to it. And so Monty sought him, sought him out and met him while he was managing an exhibition stall in Liverpool. Well, much to his delight, the whole challenging idea immediately appealed to Joe, who had himself experienced the poor catering, and he could also do with a more lucrative existence than he was used, having at the moment. From Monty's viewpoint, the important thing was that Joe agreed to his name being used for the firm to be registered as J. Lyons and Company, which we, it now became in 1887. So we now have four co-founders. First three, plus Joseph Lyons. Barnett Salmon was considerably older than his brothers-in-law and he was to die just a few years after the company was set up. Isidore was the more involved in the accountancy and the administrative side of the business uh, than the operational aspects. And so the key initial figures were to be Monty and Joe. But don't imagine Joe was just going to be a front man. Part of the agreement was that he be appointed the first chairman 
and managing director of the company. And the year was now 1887. He was 39 years old, and as it turned out, he was so well regarded for his ideas and his flair that he retained that position until his death 30 years later. This arrangement suited his co-founders to let the public believe that this catering company actually belonged to Joe Lyons for reasons I've already given. They didn't want their name connected with it. And provided they continued to hold the purse strings and were responsible for all the important decisions. Joe didn't have any children, so after his death, it fell to successive generations of the Salmons and Glucksteins to continue running the company, which they did with tremendous success for many years. But they never had any wish to depart from the original business name of J. Lyons & Co., and it remained that name throughout the company's independent lifetime. So I'm going to share with you this unique story of inspiration and endeavour. Uh, the year was 1887, year of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, year of great festivity, exhibitions all over the country. No better time for the embryo company to start on its great enterprise as exhibitions capers. So as a trial run, they tendered for contract to manage the catering at the Newcastle Jubilee Exhibition. And they won the contract hands down because they had original ideas. These included not just catering, but of course a large tobacco display with cigar making demonstration. And Joe took the other herd of course of engaging a band of first class musicians to perform in the refreshment pavilion. I'm going to show you the first menu. Uh, which, as you see on the left, is the cover of the menu, and on the right is the inside. The refreshment pavilion at Newcastle on Tyne, 18 day seven. The first catering contract carried out by J. Lyons and Co. Limited. I think you will agree in itself that's an in ambitious statement because we, here we are, it's our first catering contract, but uh, everybody, it's not going to be the last one. And then on the inside, tea and coffee used in this cafe may be had of the attendants, so they weren't just uh, serving it to uh, people in the restaurant, they were selling it uh, to take away in lead packets. We didn't have tea standards in those days, but nevertheless, sold in lead packets at the price of two, two and six pence per pound. And you see the coffee was also sold. And then on the right, you see it says Indo-Chinese Pavilion Cafe, where you see the sort of uh, architecture that gave it that uh, name, and then lower down, tea specially made for each customer, coffee freshly roasted, ground and infest infused continuously. So there we are, that was the first catering contract. Well, this experiment was an historic success. Tea in the cafe, uh, sold at Tuppence in the old money, Tuppence a cup, and that sell in itself was an innovation because it was considerably cheaper than it used to be, but you may be surprised to hear that it bought a handsome profit. So with this experience, they went the following year to the Glasgow exhibition, where they repeated their success, and here we have the Bishop's Cafe, and there it says J. Lyons & Co. of London, and a huge number of waitresses lined up, you see, all the way along. And uh, it was a very, very busy uh, exhibition, a uh, very busy uh, uh, cafe. Uh, and uh, it all went very well in that exhibition until the last day when there was such a rush on refreshments, it was clear they're going to run out of food. Well, Joe wasn't dismayed. He managed to charter every vehicle he could find, horse carts, horse vans, even hand carts, and he sent colleagues to every provision shop in the city. And within one hour, more than 20 tons of food had been collected, plus large quantities of drink. And by the time the exhibition closed that night, uh, more than 50,000 people had been fed throughout the exhibition. Um, one of the main food suppliers had been Tommy Lipton, the self-made tea tycoon, tea tycoon, whose up-and-coming groceries empire 
was based in Glasgow. And this would be the start of a great friendship between Joe Lyons and Tommy Lipton, even to the extent of accompanying Lipton to America when he raced for Great Britain in the America's Cup yacht race. But uh, as they say, that's another story. Following Glasgow's success, J. Lyons' company was invited the next year, 1889, to take part in the catering for the Paris exhibition, celebrating the centenary of the French Revolution and the opening of the Eiffel Tower. Well, the next milestone came later in 1889 when the company arrived at Olympia. The Olympiac exhibition halls had recently opened and Jay Lyons won the catering contract for the very first Barnum and Bailey Circus to be run at Olympia. It was the start of the long-term association of the company with events at Olympia. The company originally set up their headquarters in basement offices there, but Olympia soon became too small and they moved to premises just along the Hammersmith Road from Olympia which became known as Cadby Hall. You see there that Charles Cadby, who originally owned uh, the premises, he was a piano manufacturer and after his death the company was able to acquire the site and these Cadby Hall premises expanded tremendously over the years, becoming the site for their main factory and the hub of the organisation uh, for most of the company's life. One writer's description of its location is where Hammersmith starts to get serious pretensions about being Kensington. As you see, the address was uh, West Kensington, London. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about uh, Cadby Hall later on, but just for now, I'll show you some of the Lions delivery vans in the forecourt of Cadby Hall in the early days. Well, we come to the year 1894, and this was a real landmark. The company had been trading for seven years as exhibition caterers, but this was the year they became a public company, and they really became known to the public, public because they had seized on the brilliant idea of opening tea shops. At the time, there was nowhere for decent people, particularly women on their own or with children, to get a cup of tea and something safe to eat in clean surroundings. So to provide tea shops of good quality and reasonably priced was a very welcome step for everyone. Well, Lyons acquired premises that belonged to a harness maker in a side street known as Eagle Place, which uh, in fact still Eagle Place still exists. It adjoins Piccadilly to German Street. And it was here that the company history was made on the 20th of September, 1894, when they opened the very tea shop, first tea shop, 213 Piccadilly. The plaque, which is the blue plaque, that was added later uh, to show it was the first tea shop. And it remained open for 82 years until 1976, which is uh, probably one of the longest tea shops that remained open. So it's quite possible that some of you have visited that actual tea shop. But it was a great sensation from the very first day. Queues formed early, customers waited outside on benches, which had been thoughtfully provided by the management. Tea was freshly made for each customer, yet it was realistically priced. And on the outside, the jail name J. Lance and Co. Limited was embossed, as you see there, in pure gold leaf. And that design remained virtually unchanged for all of the tea shops. Well, I say all the tea shops because over the next 75 years, the uh, company opened many. In their heyday, there were 250 of them open at one time. They were mainly in London. At one time, there were at least nine tea shops operating in Oxford Street alone. Nine in Oxford Street. There were many others scattered across the country in large cities and towns, as large far apart as Blackpool in the north, Ipswich in the east, west of Supermare and Exeter in the west, and many in southern England. Practically every seaside town on the south coast had at least one tea shop. There was a selection of them, 
That's one of the tea shops in Brighton. Brighton had four. And then the Oxford Street, that's one of those nine tea shops I was talking about. The Ealing Broadway one I'm showing you because uh, it's a representative of the many products that Lyons placed in their windows for sale to customers or passers-by. And then the one in Plymouth, New George Street, that was not opened until 1955. But the original one was bombed out during the war. So uh, that was Lyons one that, uh, that was the Plymouth one that replaced the Lyons one. Rather different architecture, more modern, but still the same food products in the window and the J. Lyons & Co. Uh, emblazoned across the top. Uh, so in each tea shop, uh, the, the food and beverage charges were identical, irrespective of where they were. Their tea was also always considered to be the best quality on the market. And tea shops were really great for the general public. People out shopping would drop in for a coffee. Shop assistants, business people would go there for a light lunch. Celebrities would arrange to meet and dine there. Uh, talking of bombed tea shop, here's a picture of the Coventry Street temporary tea shop uh, that was opened in Coventry, as Coventry City, I should say, uh, that was opened uh, in Coventry after the Blitz. And you'll see that uh, wonderful tea shop in the shadow of the uh, Coventry cathedrals, of course, which uh, were heavily bombed apart from the structure that you see there, and uh, people actually lining up to get into the tea shop. Well, now I come to the famous corner house restaurants, which came on the scene in London in 1909, when Lyons opened the first tea shop in Coventry Street, nothing to do with Coventry City, Coventry Street, lying between Leicester Square and uh, Piccadilly Circus. And uh, whenever I mention uh, corner houses, uh, someone usually says, I remember being taken there by my parents, having my first Knickerbocker glory or huge lemon meringue pie. Well, there are eventually four of these corner houses. That was the first one, the flagship, Coventry Street. And then there was the Strand. That used to lie between uh, Charing Cross Station and Trafalgar Square. And if you were to go there today, you'd find the structure is still there, but it's, it's opened by Boots the Chemist. And then the third one was the Oxford. Uh, situation uh, entrances in Oxford Street and Tottenham Court Road, uh, called the Oxford because it's built on the site of the very first, one of the very first music halls called the Oxford. And you see that the Oxford Street restaurant, uh, Oxford Street uh, entrance. And here on the right is uh, one of those nine tea shops in Oxford Street. And on the left, the Wimpy, which I'll talk about a bit later on. Uh, and then the fourth one was uh, Marble Arch. And that's one of the restaurants inside the Marble Arch tea shop. Huge restaurants, as you see. Uh, the largest, uh, as I've said, I was the uh, Coventry Street one, which would uh, seat or could seat 4,000 customers at any time, any one time. The splendor and glamour of these corner houses were quite daunting for children visiting for the first time. There were huge chandeliers all over the place, rubber plants and waving palms and vast mirrors and glittering glass cabinets. There was live music playing to the diners almost continuously throughout the day and the evening. And the music ranged from 12-piece dance bands through palm court orchestras to Hungarian gypsy trios and even flamenco dancers, as you see there. That was at the uh, Coventry Street corner house, the flamenco room, twice nightly dancers. And here on the next slide is the Oxford Corner House Brasserie, very crowded with diners, and up in the top right hand corner, uh, one of those orchestras I was talking about. And then to talking about orchestras, here's the Ivy Benson and her girls' orchestra uh, at playing at the Marble Arch. 
At every corner house, there was a food hall on the ground floor, and there were daily food delivery service to any address in London. Within the corner houses, some of the restaurants had specific menus and names to go with them, as you see on this next slide, the bacon and egg, grill and cheese, and then the restaurant tray, which was uh, later on, that was when the self-service was introduced, so we had customers with the uh, restful trays queuing up to collect their dinners. And there were always the salad bowl, uh, where you could replenish your plate to your heart's content. So now let's lead on to the nippies. From the opening of the very first tea shop in 1894, until the start of self-service in World War II, Lions employed mainly female staff in their tea shops and corner houses. After the war, they returned to the corner houses, which is probably where you may have met the Nippies. The waitresses were originally known as Gladysses, which was a fashionable name in those days. And that were clothed, as you see, in the uniform of Edwardian maids, uncomfortable serge material, heavily corseted, as you'll see from the caption, Waist was 17 inches in my day. Well, there was a highly successful marketing move in the, move in the early 1920s. And on the 1st of January 1925, they were transformed overnight into the modern dress of the time, which you see on the right. At the same time, the company decided to give their new look girls a new name. They had a staff competition which gave rise to many extraordinary ideas, such as Miss Natty, Busy Bertha, Dexterous Dora, but none of these had quite the right ring, and they finally struck on the word nippy, which had an endearing feel, but also the right overtones of swiftness and efficiency. At a talk that I gave to another group, a lady in the audience told me that her mother had been a nippy, but her name was Gladys. Uh, this one on the next slide served Marble Arch Corner House. They had to dress immaculately, starch Peter Pan collars, caps or coronets as they were known, with the logo directly over the nose, 30 rows of buttons, hand sewn, cross stitched with red cotton, and they had to do an intensive training course. Uh, covered such things as dress, deportment, the art of changing a tablecloth, laying up a table, general rules of serving, how to write down an order, the meaning of items on the menu, menu which may have been written in French, and above all, civility to customers. Customers always right, even if it is wrong. At the same time, these, during these courses, they were given insight into the excellent welfare facilities facilities available to all employees, such as the free medical, dental and chiropathy at Cadby Hall, before we had the NHS, and the wonderful recreational facilities at Lions Club at Sudbury Hill near Wembley, 78 acres of sports ground, which was said to cover every sporting activity other than ice skating. The subscription was threepence per week, stopped out of their wages. Well, returning to this new nippy era, caught on beyond the promoter's wildest dreams, named after the nippy were a rose at the Chelsea Flower Show, where Lions did the catering, as well as a railway engine, a racehorse, and a Battle of Britain Spitfire. Uh, uh, the story behind this is that uh, large companies by, like Lyons were invited to donate money towards the building of Spitfires during uh, the Battle of Britain, 1940, and Lyons were able to donate £5,000 as donations from their members, uh, their employees, which was a uh, quite a large amount of money in those days. The company also produced a brand of chocolates and cigarettes called the Nippy. And the directors used to visit hospitals at Christmas time to distribute cigarettes to the patients. 
which may surprise you, but uh, not surprising in those days, how times have changed. The famous actress of her time, Binny Hale, played the lead in a new musical comedy called Nippy, and that's the cover of the in-house magazine Lion's Mail, depicting, as it said, the hale and charming Miss Nippy at the Princess, Prince Edward Theatre uh, in the year 1930. Having told you something about the tea shops and corner houses, there is another restaurant that certainly deserves a place in history. Soon after Lyons became a public company, they acquired premises on the corner of Shaftesbury Avenue and Great Windmill Street on which they were to build the world-famous Trocadero restaurant. This was obviously a picture from the 1930s, but it was opened in 1986, just two years after the first, first uh, restaurant or first uh, tea shop. And it was named Trocadero after another music hall that had previously stood on that site. And here on the next slide is the splendidly appointed uh, entrance lounge. Note the uh, counter on the left with Lion's Chocolate, Lion's Brand Chocolate. The Trocadero opened literally in a blaze of glory with the fireworks display in Piccadilly Circus. Joe presided over the inaugural dinner, which was attended by the Lord Mayor and some of the best known figures of Victorian society from many walks of life. At the end of the evening, Joe's sister-in-law, uh, Katie Christian of the Doyle Cart Opera, sang the National Anthem. And the singing of the National Anthem of the Trocadero became customary each night at closing time up to the beginning of wartime. Before I leave this slide, take a look at the balcony and the staircase, because on the next slide, in glorious Technicolor, is the uh, picture of that uh, balcony and staircase, and the murals at the top were all representing scenes from Knights of the Round Table. Concert teas were introduced at the Trocadero during the First World War, Cabaret was introduced in the 1920s, continuing every night until the outbreak of World War II. Charles Cochran, C.B. Cochran, who was a leading impresario of his time, staged many successful shows there. There was a chorus line known as the Cochran Young Ladies, and among those cutting their teeth as dancers were Jesse Matthews, who many of you probably will remember, and another name, a lady whose name was Marjorie Robertson, uh, she became later a well-known actress and film star. If I was giving this talk live, I would ask you to guess who she was, but if you've already guessed, or if you haven't, I can tell you that she was to eventually be Alan Neagle, uh, who started her uh, acting career as a dancer at the Trocadero. Not content with just exhibition and restaurant catering, they turned their attention to hotels. And there were more than 40 hotels, eventually under the Lion's ownership. I'm just going to show you four of these. First was Strand Palace, which opened in 1909. Uh, major success because it had hot and cold water in every room. And that was a luxury in this country at that time. And then there was the Regent Palace, which opened in 1915, had over a thousand bedrooms, and it was the largest in Europe at the time. And they employed more than a thousand staff. The hotel was bombed twice during the Second World War, but like its neighbouring Windmill Theatre, never closed and remained open until 2006. Then there was the Cumberland, uh, Marble Arch opened in 1933, and that represented the peak of their hotel program to date, with the very latest in luxury. Uh, and the Marble Arch Corner House, which I've already spoken about, was right next door and opened the same year. And then there was Tower Hotel, which opened after the war at St Catherine's Rock, London, near to the Tower of London, 
and this was the hotel to be built in or near the city of London for over a hundred years. Well, you'll probably be thinking by now that there seems to be nothing that Lyons and Co. couldn't achieve. As early as 1901, 1901, they started catering for many outside events at the Crystal Palace. The FA Cup final used to be held there, and it was 1901 when Jay Lyons did the catering, employing 11,000 staff. You see that uh, it was uh, FA Cup final was between the Spurs and Sheffield Wednesday. And after the event, Joe was interviewed by a magazine called the Westminster Gazette. And he said, I must tell you, uh, said Mr. Lyons, we had very little of anything left over. Such a run on cakes and buns I've never seen. The only dish that might be said to remain was sardines. Well, just take a look at what they did consume. Here we are, what the crowd consumed at the Crystal Palace FA Cup final. Extraordinary amount of, of food. Uh, 120,000 bottles of mineral water were washed down. Uh, they had no license for alcohol at the time. And as I said, 11,000 staff were employed to serve out this gigantic meal. <coughs> well, for football aficionados among you, the match between Spurs and Sheffield Wednesday ended in a two-all draw. There was no extra time or penalty shootouts in those days, so they had to do a replay uh, the following Saturday at Bolton uh, when Spurs won, but I've no idea who did the catering at that event. From 1919, there were the Buckingham Palace Garden Party. That picture was taken in July 1951, when George VI and Queen Elizabeth were still on the throne. A common practice to employ nippies from each of the tea shops and restaurants, not wearing their coronets for this photo. Perhaps they didn't want to upstage the Queen. Largest number ever catered for was 15,000, 15,000 in the 1930s. That's twice the number at today's garden parties. And then there were the events at catering, events at Windsor Castle, the Guild Hall for the Lord Mayor's Banquets, Wimbledon Strawberry Teas, Chelsea Flower Shows, and here a couple of lovely off-duty nippies at one of those flower shows. <coughs> the so-called Feast of the 8,000 in 1925 uh, that was the most spectacular of the many luncheons and dinners that Lyons organised at Olympia in the Grand Hall. It was a Masonic festival, a peace memorial fundraising event with Freemasons from all over the world raising a million pounds towards the building of the Freemasons Grand Lodge in Great Queen Street. Nippy waitresses had been created that very same year, so this was the first event, and 1,300 nippies had been brought from all over the country, specially trained, with 700 cooks and porters. Uh, you can see them on this slide, spaced out between the tables, uh, waiting for the guests all around the hall, and on my next slide, you can see the guests actually seated and awaiting the dinner waiting their banquet. You can imagine the event had to be conducted with military precision by one of the company directors who sat in a specially built tower above the banquet area, which he called the Conning Tower. Orders to the missing waitresses to bring on the dishes done by bells and coloured lights. No mobile phones in these days, ladies and gentlemen. A little about the company products. These are just a few of the products that will strike a chord in the memory. I've also already mentioned large tea, the Dundee cake, the coffee, individual fruit pies, <coughs> the uh, large polar made ice creams, and of course the Swiss rolls. Even in the 1920s, the weekly production of Swiss rolls was half a million or 
36 miles of Swiss Row. Well, I told you something about Cadby Hall earlier on. I'm now going to tell you a little more detail on this next slide. It was eventually to occupy 13 acres. And just to orientate you, here is Olympia up here. And this is the Hammersmith Road. And you can see the various aspects of the food production. Here we have the bread bakery, Swiss roll bakery, cake bakery, individual fruit pie bakery. And then we have ice cream factory. And then up here, the medical department, which I told you had, uh, had facilities for medical, dental, and uh, chiropody. And here we have a supermarket. Originally, this was opened as a grocery store just for the employees, but it became so successful that it became open to the public. And then it became a supermarket, uh, but one of the very first supermarkets in 1955. Here we have Elms House, which is the only part of Cadby Hall which uh, is still remaining, and it has some familiarity to people who worked on Leo, which I won't dwell on at the moment. And here we have the laboratories. And uh, in the food laboratory, uh, Margaret Thatcher worked for a couple of years. After she'd come down from Oxford, Somerville College, Oxford, trained as a chemist, she worked in the uh, food laboratories for two years. Uh, even while she was at Lyons, she stood unsuccessfully as a candidate for Dartford in the 1950 election. And then, of course, after she left Lyons, uh, she left, uh, she met Dennis and the rest of the history, the rest is own history. Uh, the then Princess Elizabeth, oh, sorry, that was Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Roberts, as you see, the lady was not returning. Uh, the uh, then Princess Elizabeth uh, visited Cadby Hall on the 15th of February 51, 1951, just over 70 years ago, as it happens. And that visit was in recognition of the Buckingham Palace garden parties. Well, going back to my previous slide, you'll see there's no, uh, no uh, recognition of uh, tea or coffee, no sign of tea or coffee in production. And that was because by the end of the World War One, even Cadby Hall's capacity wasn't enough for the increasing number of products. And so in 1921, another large factory was opened west of London at Greenford, primarily for the production of packet tea and coffee, and later on refectionery. Opened in 1921, just 100 years ago, and that's an artist's impression of the Greenford complex. You can see up here the Grand Union Canal. And then the Great Western Railway here to the south. <coughs> the factory had its own siding. And tea was imported from Lyon's own tea plantations, which they had <coughs> in Nyasaland, Malawi, as we know it today. <clears throat> imported to Tilbury and then proceeding by barge through the River Thames and Grand Union Canal to Greenford. And the finished products were then taken from the factory by rail or road. And it's interesting to note that the cereal Ready Breck was developed at Greenford, later taken over by Weetabix. And Greenford also produced the very first tea bags on the UK market after the war. <clears throat> During the Second World War, the company was involved in many activities supporting the war effort, such as supplying millions of compra rations to the forces worldwide, Red Cross parcels to prisoners of war. Perhaps the most extraordinary activity in the war was that the management skills of the company were exploited by invitation of the government to manage one of the largest ordnance factories at Elstow, near Bedford. As you see there, manufacturing bombs. Well, this activity was said to be done in the utmost security, although at one talk I gave, a lady in the audience came up to me afterwards and said she'd been to Elstow 
as a child during the war and we knew something was going on. Well, I doubt if many people knew that that activity was being managed by a catering company. <clears throat> well, ladies and gentlemen, I've told you a lot about the company's extraordinary achievements, but what I'm going to tell you now, in my opinion, beats everything for innovation and enterprise. Huge rise in office costs after the Second World War made the company realize that some form of automation was essential for such things as stock control and payroll for their large number of employees. Nothing was available to them anywhere in the world to meet their needs. And so with their usual self-assurance, which you've already seen, they set about designing and building their own computer, which they called LEO, standing for Lions Electronic Office. Uh, most of you know quite a lot about LEO. So I'm just going to say a very little about it. Uh, uh, most of you having worked on LEO or successors, and we do have another Zoom arranged for July when our colleague John Danes, who has a lot of LEO experience, will be talking about it in some depth. I just want to say that today our computers, our tablets, our smartphones, part of everyday life. In the late 1940s, computers were in their infancy and no one else in the world had developed a computer for office or business automation. It seems extraordinary to everyone that a catering company with no history of electronics engineering could embark on such a project, but remember that right from the outset, the company had developed this can-do culture, so the Lions Board were confident that the seemingly impossible could be achieved as long as it was properly managed and organized. And I'm sure you probably, uh, all of you have seen this next slide with Leo One, it's 6,000 valves, the occupation of 5,000 square feet, including peripherals. Well, development started in 1949 and Leo was ready for operation in 1951. By the end of 53, Leo was reliable enough to undertake payroll, a task which had to be performed at time because staff had to be paid weekly. The task of calculating an employee's pay until then took an experienced clerk eight minutes per employee. And Leo had done the job in just one and a half seconds. Before long, it was doing payroll for 10,000 employees and it never went wrong. Leo had achieved a well-deserved place in the Guinness World Records, acknowledged as the world's first business computer, and that is as much as I'm going to say about Leo more in the next episode in July. So, how did it all end? Seems a good point to tell you how the Joe Lyons catering empire began to unwind, because people do often ask, Whatever happened to Lyons? In the post war years, changing eating habits caused the restaurants, tea shops to become less popular. A new generation came to prefer fast food, pizza restaurants, and takeaway foods. Lyons did try to keep up with the times with some successful innovations, such as the London Steakhouses and the Wimpy Bars, which I showed you on an earlier slide. Wimpy was an American invitation. Lions were to acquire the title and they opened the very first one in 1954. More than 500 in this country and a thousand overseas were opened. And it was, of course, the forerunner to the hamburger. That is one of the, that is the uh, first Wimpy bar opened in 1954 at the Lions Corner House. Some of the uh, tea shops were converted to London steakhouses. Others were converted to wimpy restaurants. And as you see, some of the corner houses had wimpy bars. Uh, but not all of their in in innovations achieved such positive results post-World War II. In fact, what turned out to be a rush of madness, they tried out the idea of placing a restaurant 
on the top of a London bus, the used for sightseeing, to be known as the Upper Crust. Had just 24 seats for diners, the kitchens and toilets were on the lower deck. And here's the top deck of that London bus. The tour started and ended at Victoria Coach Station. Four course, me four course meal with champagne was served for inclusive price of £10. The original idea was to stop the bus at a convenient point so that the meal could be eaten at a standstill, but legal advice ruled this out because the licensing authorities uh, uh, pronounced that the dust bus would be a restaurant if it was stationary, and in the event, the company was issued with a police summons for serving alcohol on public transport. They had the added problem of mechanical reliability. The bus suffered several brief breakdowns during the first week of operation. Well, you may have guessed the project was not a startling success, although it was subsequently hired for special events. For example, the Daily Mirror hired it to entertain guests at a varsity Mac at Twickenham, and a private individual paid £260 to hire it for his son's bar mitzvah entertainment. Perhaps one positive result for the company was that they could claim in hindsight to have run the very first upper crust restaurant. Well, the company's real design declined started in the 1970s. The company had overstretched on its borrowings when they were hit. The UK was hit by the oil crisis in 74, and then the start of recession, high inflation, and adverse exchange rates. Losses led to closure of restaurants, withdrawal of some food products from, uh, from the market, and in 1978, the Joe Lyons Company accepted an offer to merge with Ally Breweries. J. Lyons & Co. had lost its independence and became the food division of Allied Lyons. The last tea shop to close was in Marble Arch in 1981. The company's component parts were gradually sold to pay for acquisitions mainly associated with the drinks trade, which you may not be surprised to hear, being with Allied Breweries. And the year 1894 marked the merger of Allied Lions with the Spanish wine company Pedro Domecq to become Allied Domecq. So that can be really uh, considered to be the end of the Lion story, but I started it by telling you something about Joe Lyons himself. I explained that he died without issue in 1917, but the company, <coughs> the company carried on uh, throughout its independent lifetime as J. Lyons and Co. And the year 2017, 2017, marked the centenary of his death. The previous year, it so happened that the block of flats opposite Olympia, where he had lived in the 1890s, was reopened after an expensive refurbishment, and English Heritage chose to un unveil this blue plaque there. There is actually the blue plaque, and what it says, Sir Joseph Lyons, 1847 to 1917, pioneer of mass catering, lived here. There's Olympia opposite. Uh, well, people sometimes question why Joe received a knighthood while Monty Gluckstein, the other original driving force, didn't. Well, quite simply, I can explain that Joe's knighthood was not related to his catering activities. Told you at the beginning that he had many interests, and after the Boer War, he became interested in military matters and in the training of the newly restructured Reserve Army. He joined the Territorial Forces Association that administered the formation of the new Territorial Force in 1908, and Joe organised the athletics events for the London Territorial Event Force at the 
White City in 1909 and the National Territorial Force at the Crystal Palace the following year. So it was for this service to the community that he received his knighthood in 1911. And by the way, uh, several of the Samuel Gluckstein younger generation were to receive knighthoods or other honours in later years. After his uh, knighthood, the magazine Vanity Fair, uh, sorry, it was before his knighthood, in fact, published that splendid portrait of Joe uh, after he'd been created Deputy Lieutenant of the County of London. And after Joe's death in 1917, uh, Monty became chairman of the company, uh, but sadly only for five years as he himself was to die in 1922. I'm going to read you, in conclusion, a piece from the Sunday Times written by the journalist T.P. O'Connor in 1922, after Monty's death, describing the contrasting personalities of Joe and Monty. What he says is, I heard with the shock of the death of Monty, so everybody called him Monty Gluckstein. I didn't know that he was even ill, and that death at 68 for a man of normal health appears to me like being off, cut off in the flower prematurely. There were several big men in the creation of the two gigantic businesses, Lyons and Sam and Gluckstein. Yet, to the general public, there was only one who was really well known. That was Joe Lyons. Joe Lyons fully deserved his place in the public eye, for he was really a genius in his way, with extraordinary versatility. I think he was the best storyteller I have ever heard. Above all, he had the gift of mimicry to an extraordinary degree. When you told you an English story, he was an Englishman. A Jewish story, he was a Jew. An Irish story, he was an Irishman. He could paint, he could write novels, not with conspicuous success, it is true, but not at all badly. And, of course, he was the Prince of Showman. Without his splendid publicity work, the great firm would never have reached its extraordinary success. Behind him, however, there was another big brain, and that was Monty Gluckstein. And the two men could not have been more contrasted. Joe Lyons loved to be in the public eye, not from sheer vanity, but perhaps as part of his business instinct. Monty Gluckstein hated publicity in any form. I believe he resisted becoming chairman of the Lyons Company for some time, largely because of his, this hatred of the mention of his name in public. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I provided some food for thought by describing the ways in which this remarkable British catering company became distinguished over a period of 100 years. Performing a vast number of activities within the catering industry and also outside of it. Some of the features were well known to many of you, such as the tea shops, corner houses, and of course the nippies, but you may well have been fascinated by the other amazing achievements of this company, like the huge banquets and outside catering, and the splendid staff training and welfare facilities, not to mention, of course, the invention of Leo, first business computer. All these achievements can be attributed to the drive of the personalities handling the business, to the organization skills of the management, and to the wonderful support and camaraderie of those who work for Lions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Um, I'll be happy to uh, hear any questions, so uh, I'm going to uh, unshare my screen, I hope. Uh,